Good morning, everyone. You're listening to the award-winning program, Exceptional Women. This is Magic's Sue Tab, and I'm here in studio with a renowned breast surgeon from Brigham and Women's Faulkner Hospital. She is Dr. Faina Nachlis, who will share with us today why being a clinician and teacher in the specialty of breast surgery has been so gratifying for her, and what is being done in the field to improve care and quality of life for patients. Welcome, Dr. Nachlis. Well, thank you. So glad we're able to air this interview on this specific Sunday because it is October and October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So I guess I want to ask you as a breast surgeon, tell us from your perspective what raising awareness and funds and all the things that go on in the month of October mean to the field. Well, this is a very important month for the field and Breast cancer is a very common problem that women face. It's one of the most common health issues and raising awareness of it and raising funds that would help solve or help alleviate this problem is of great significance. So I'm an example, and I've shared this with a lot of people, so it doesn't come as a surprise to some, but I am a breast cancer survivor. And I am one of those people that I guess I'm an example of early detection saving lives because I was diagnosed, it was stage zero DCIS. I got away with just a biopsy and radiation, but I met many women along the journey that had a much harder, much more difficult prognosis that they were facing. And I guess my question is, no matter if you're stage zero, stage four, whatever you are, when you hear the words, you have cancer. It's pretty life-changing, and you have to see that every day, day to day in your work. How do you handle that? How do you deal with that? Because it's a very intimate relationship that you have with these women. Absolutely. I'm, first of all, very happy to hear that you're doing so well. Thank you. And I can tell you that when this news has to be given to a patient or you're witnessing the woman realizing that this is the news, it's almost an audible or a palpable sensation that you're aware of. You can almost feel it. Life has changed now, no matter how curable the disease might be. And this interaction then goes goes to a different level. It's a human level because we are all vulnerable. And I think then it comes down to compassion and just what we can do for each other and sympathize with each other because it could be anyone. Is that something you can teach, compassion? I know that you spend a lot of your time teaching, correct? About half the week teaching residents and fellows. How do you handle that piece of it aside from the academic piece of it. Can you teach compassion? Because it's so important to have that as a doctor, right? I actually think you can because when residents and students come to clinics with us and they see how we interact with a patient who is newly diagnosed with breast cancer, how that interaction goes and how you behave and act. And it's not just giving the patient a list of options or a menu of options to choose from, but how you empathize and how you interact. So you act more as a role model. They're watching what you do and you're setting the standard. Exactly. And I myself have learned so much when I was in their shoes watching the attending doctor interact with the patient because you can read many of these things, but it's not the same as seeing how the actual interaction takes place. Because I remember very vividly my first interaction with my oncologist. She was terrific because the first thing that she said to me, even though I knew that I was going to be okay, you're petrified. I mean, there's just no way you're petrified. I was in the Johnny and I mean, there's nothing more humbling than the hospital Johnny. Absolutely. And I'm in Mm -hmm. the Johnny and I'm sitting there thinking, oh my God, you're just having this out of body Mm -hmm. experience. Like I can't believe that I'm sitting here Mm -hmm. as a cancer patient and what is going to happen to me next. And it's fear of the unknown and what you have ahead of you. And she just came in and it was the simplest thing, but she put her hand on my knee And she said, you are going to be okay. You have a 100% chance of beating this. 100% chance. You're going to be fine. But just the fact that she sort of touched my knee and she smiled at me and she looked me in the eye, that helped so much because it broke the ice and it just put out the fire where I could take a deep breath and say, okay, what do I have to do? Right? Because that's what, you know, the bottom line is, what do I have to do to get through this? You know, and you deal with this every day. But you know what I wanted to ask you, what's changed? Because we have come a long way from even 5, 10, 15 years ago. The way that we diagnose and even treat breast cancer is much different than it was several years back. What would you say are the biggest milestones or the biggest changes 
I would say the most impactful change is what you've already alluded to, and that's early detection. That's one of the major strides, and it allows us to be able to say that most people with breast cancer in this country are cured. It's been a major undertaking. It's met with many challenges, but that's one of the major advances. And the other advance, and that's outside of the field of surgery, is systemic therapy, so chemotherapy, medications. They have really become far more advanced, personalized to some degree, and of course more work is being done in that direction, but this is what has changed the landscape of breast cancer and its prognosis and the outlook. When you say changed, do you mean that like say with chemotherapy drugs, are there less side effects now? Are they more specifically targeted for the type of cancer? Explain what you mean by that a little bit. It's actually a little bit of both because there is this ongoing quest for targeted therapy. The way chemotherapy is administered there is much more what we call preemptive management. So all the dreaded stereotypical side effects like nausea, that's being prevented before it happens. So people do much better with all of this. I have a girlfriend who's gone through it and she worked right through chemotherapy. I can't say that she was enjoying it, but she she was was able to. Yes, she was able to. Her symptoms were being managed and prevented and preempted so that she was able to function. And for many people, that's the case. And it's very nice to see. Especially earlier in my career, it was very eye-opening for me that chemotherapy has been made much more palatable. For those of you just joining us, good morning and welcome to Exceptional Women on Magic 106.7. I'm Sue Tab, and this morning we are talking with Dr. Faina Naklis, a breast surgeon from Brigham and Women's Faulkner Hospital. Let's get back to our conversation. I want to talk to you a little bit about your personal journey. You were born in the Ukraine? Yes. And Mm -hmm. when did you come over to the U.S.? In 1989. And did you know from an early age that you wanted to be a doctor? Uh, Maybe not fully (laughs) and consciously. I think it may have crystallized later, maybe when I was a teenager. But I am from a medical family, so it may have been bound to happen one way or another. Oh, parents are doctors? Mm, My father. Yeah, he's a surgeon. He was a surgeon in Ukraine. Oh, yeah. So So you saw it from a young age. I did see it, although he didn't in any way encourage me to go into medicine or surgery, but maybe it's genetic. I'm not sure. (laughs) (laughs) And what made you pick surgery and later breast surgery as your field of concentration? What was it about that that sort of compelled you to go in that direction? So surgery was actually a, a revelation for me because a stereotypical surgeon when I started medical school to me was a mean, nasty, temperamental, <laughs> and not compassionate person. And what I saw, I mean, some of it may have been there. It's been a long time since I was in medical school, but surgery is actually a very versatile, all-encompassing field. Not only do you have to be good with your hands, but you do have to be compassionate. You have to take care of your patients because it is the most intimate relationship, I think that you may have as a professional, as a medical provider, because they entrust your body to you when they're asleep. I was just going to say, you go under and it's like, here you go, here I am. So I thought it was just absolutely fascinating that you have to be able to have this trust and be an all around, you know, good provider. And so I thought that was great. And it's not just the manual techniques. It's not just being busy with your hands, but it's being a good doctor. And that's what attracted me to surgery. Breast surgery was also a surprise because having started in general surgery, and I absolutely love general surgery to this day, I never thought I would narrow my scope to this discipline or this area of interest. But breast oncology and breast surgical oncology, to me, was an absolutely fascinating field, ever-changing, very dynamic. And there's so much that's been learned, and there's even more to know. So I thought it would just be so great to get involved in. And I did have wonderful role models. I have to say that along the way, I have been extremely fortunate to have been exposed to the people that I have been exposed to. And I think that has had yeah, a lot to do with. Yeah, it makes a lot of with. difference, doesn't it? When you have people that you respect and look up to and that you know have your best interests at heart, and that makes all the difference. And you've spent a lot of time teaching. And I want to talk about that and why that's so important to you to sort of pass down. Is it because you feel like you had such good role models and you're paying it forward and saying, I want to do the same for a young person trying to come up in the ranks? I think a lot of it is that because I often think to myself, somebody had to endure me. (laughs) But at the same time, you know, the reality is that 
that this must be passed down because people have to be taken care of and those of us who possess certain skills have to share them because of course we're all mortal and it is critically important that we teach and pass the knowledge skills down. down. And you do a lot of research as well and you know people listening probably don't have that <laughs> medical knowledge that you do but if you can tell us in layman's terms some of the research that you've done in what you're most proud of in terms of that. So there is one project that's complete and it's looking at the role of surgery for a certain pre-malignant lesion whose behavior is actually very fascinating and not well known, but the question was more about whether or not when it's seen on a needle biopsy, it needs to be further pursued. So we just completed and the publication is imminent. Oh. Um, the paper has been accepted, a study that has shown that there is no need for surgery under these circumstances that people can be spared surgery, which is great because surgery is never fun, even if the outcomes are right. benign. There's a lot of anxiety awaiting of the results and so forth. So it's saying Practice. that you could avoid that and still have a very positive outcome. You're not taking exactly. an unnecessary risk by avoiding the surgery. Exactly. Yes. Oh, that's really cool. That this is cool. So this just all happened this year that we were able to report it and the, the manuscript has been accepted. So that's one. And there's another one. We just submitted the abstract for it. This is looking at the role of surgery for women who have actually the opposite end of the spectrum problem who have metastatic breast cancer whose local breast cancer in the breast is quite advanced. It's a major dilemma whether or not these women should undergo surgery because their prognosis is Pretty defined poor, by or? exactly by their metastatic disease, by the disease that has spread. And it may not be fair to them to go through major, possibly disfiguring surgery. So there are additional studies that are on a much larger scope that are being done and the results may not be out for several years. In this project, we looked specifically at the surgical or the local complications that result from undergoing surgery or not undergoing surgery whether people do better or worse when they're left alone or if they have surgery. So it appears as though there are additional analyses that are ongoing that it may be safe to just let them be and observe them rather than subject them to... Or over-treat them. Exactly. Yeah. So maybe this is a completely silly question, but do you think, because I know that you don't have a magic ball, but do you think that we'll see a cure for cancer or any type of cancer in our lifetime? That's probably the most important question. I know, right? If <laughs> you knew that, you'd be... <laughs> so um, to give you a short answer, I'm afraid in our lifetimes, probably not. But, mm -hmm. the, but I think that the general field understands very well that the major challenge is when breast cancer spreads and what we have to do about it is our major number one priority and that is what the major problem is at the moment and breast cancer and that's one of the fascinating things about it is very diverse every diagnosis is almost a separate disease yeah so I it, learned that you know it's so funny because I learned way more than I ever wanted to know about mm -hmm. breast cancer having been a, a patient I just didn't realize how many factors there were in detecting it. I mean, I just thought you either had it or you didn't. And yes, I knew it could be further along or not further along, but I didn't realize that there are so many different types and characteristics of exactly. each person's cancer that really means that almost no two are alike. And also, people respond differently to treatment, exactly. you know, with the same cancer, same treatment, but I'm going to respond differently than you're going to respond. And it's all these things that I just, you know, they were fascinating to me, even as a patient looking around going, this is so different than it's what I very, thought. Very complex. And that is what makes it challenging, because it's a little bit of a seed and the soil phenomenon because let's say the cancer is a seed but the environment in which it occurs each patient is different each patient's environment in which the cancer grows is different and that has an influence on the outcomes too so it doesn't seem to be that there will be a magic pill at least in the near future that will be able right. to address all of this but, but on the other end of that is what you were alluding to earlier in the interview which is early detection absolutely. meaning we're going to catch a higher percentage of Absolutely. the cancers at an early rate, and that way 
maybe it's not a cure, but we're going to avoid a lot women, of people. But for many women, it is cure, actually, because early detection, if it yeah, does... Yeah, I guess I'm cured, it, right? Yeah, I'm cured. <laughs> no, early detection, it very much correlates with cure, so... That many more people will live as a result Absolutely. of that technology, Absolutely. right? Digital mammograms and that kind of thing. And what is the going sort of rule of thumb in terms of how often women should have mammograms? That's kind of changed a little I bit. Know. It's gone back and forth. It has. So tell yeah. us what right now is sort of the standard out there and so at this point, the um, standard that we adhere to is actually the same that we've been going back and forth from, but it's annual, so once a year mammogram starting at the age of 40. Okay, because for some time they were saying, oh, you mm-hmm. can wait till you're 50, and that made me a little nervous, mm-hmm. but it is 40 now, and it is yearly. It is yearly. Yeah, yes. okay. If you're just waking up and tuning in, thanks for listening to Exceptional Women on Magic 106.7. I'm Sue Tab, and this morning we are marking Breast Cancer Awareness Month by having a conversation conversation with breast surgeon Dr. Faina Naklas about her amazing career and the work she is doing at Brigham and Women's Faulkner Hospital. Let's continue on. You're a breast surgeon, you're a mom, you have a family. How do you manage it all? There are a lot of women that are listening going, wow, and you do research and you're a teacher and you have this impressive resume, but sort of how do you manage day to day? I mean, do you have time to do anything fun? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, a little bit on the weekends. <laughs> on the no, weekends. I think it's because um, being a doctor is not a job; it's a lifestyle. I mean, you are a doctor; it embodies who you are. So, how do you sort of separate that? And mm-hmm. you have all of these other things that you're doing. You're a young woman, you know. How do you manage all of that? I have to be honest with you. I. I am so lucky because I love my job to the point that sometimes I look up and it's 7 o'clock p.m. and I have to go home and I think, oh my God, I have to go home. <laughs> wow, and you really are meant to be do doing homework this. homework with my kids, but I've been blessed with that too. Although the older they get, as they say, the problems become bigger. They're not teenagers yet, but you know, it's busy with them. It's not easy. You have to plan. You have to plan everything. But I'm sure all of us have to do this. So you just have to plan. And then you have to perfect your planning. And and, I know I usually say (laughs) every day you throw the balls up in the air and you figure out how you're going to juggle them today, which might be different than how you're going to do it tomorrow, right? I always say you have to be flexible. You have to have a plan and then be willing to change it. Another question for you. What have you found to be the most challenging thing about being in your field? Like something that might have surprised you, you know, that you maybe didn't know when you were in medical school. And now you're like, wow, this is hard. Well, some of the administrative things that we have to deal with that are ever changing. It's really nothing that's very disturbing. But there are some things we're made to do documentation, things like that, they really don't have a whole lot to do with direct patient care. But that's a part of the job too. And you have to spend some time on that. It's a necessary evil, but you really like to be sleeves up in with the patients. Absolutely. It makes it all worth it. And what's been most rewarding? Like when you look on your career, and I know it's far from over, because you have a long way to go. But when you look back at what you've done so far, Anything in your mind stand out as something that you're super proud of? I would say proud of or just what's the most enjoyable thing about my work is when a patient wakes up in the recovery room after mm-hmm. a surgery or I see the patient after her surgery or his surgery or some male patients in clinic and when they're done and they say thank you. I mean, in a way, they thank me in the way they're so relieved that they're done. And that's just so wonderful they're relieved that it's behind them or at least a phase of this process is behind them and that's just so it's so powerful very moving I was just gonna say it must feel good to know that you had a direct impact on somebody's life in terms of either saving their life or extending their life or improving the quality of their life like you did that yeah it's that must be really amazing hard to believe it's hard to believe that, <laughs> it's but, amazing but I'm it's sure and very satisfying but on the other end of that There are patients that I'm sure you see lose their battle. And how do you separate that? Because that would be very hard for me to sometimes move on from that and say, that is part of the job too. You're going to see some people not make it. I have to say that in the last few years, I have actually gone through a major evolution in this regard. And that's thanks to some of my colleagues who have done work on this for whom there isn't much that can be done medically or Mm -hmm. objectively. There aren't any solutions or cure offering treatments. And there is this concept in my field or in the field of 
surgery medicine in general, it's called non-abandonment. And I've just familiarized myself with it in the last few years where I am not able to do anything for this particular individual, but the fact that I am there, that I am there as a human, Mm -hmm. because in the end, this is what it's all about. We have to be good to each other. We're all here for a short time. And I think it is incredibly helpful to people to know that while you may not offer anything objectively useful, but you are there. They right. can call, they can come in. I don't mind. You're I think s- it's they're still your patient, even exactly. though you're not maybe physically doing something for them. Exactly. You're emotionally helping them through this stage. We're running out of time, unfortunately. What advice would you give for others who may want to get into your field? I would give one piece of advice. Do what you love for anyone yeah. in those going into my field. If you do what you love, that's the best thing that can happen to you. And do you have a favorite quote or phrase or something that you learn that you sort of keep in the back of your mind to keep you focused? I guess that probably be along the same lines as, you know, the phrase, do what you love and love what you do. Yeah. So it makes it easy. And that's why when I look up and it's seven o'clock, <laughs> I don't even mind. Yeah, I have to go home. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us today. I want to thank you, Dr. Knockless, for sharing your perspective, milestones, and work in the area of breast cancer and diseases of the breast. As a breast surgeon, teacher, speaker, author, you are part of a team of professionals working to improve treatment, patient care, and hopefully one day celebrate a world without this disease. You are an inspiration to all of us, and I, for one, am happy to know that you are on our team. You're truly an exceptional woman, so thanks again for taking time out of your busy schedule to chat with all of us today. It's been my pleasure to have Dr. Faina Knockless in studio today. I'm Sue Tab, and I'm I want to thank all of you at home for listening to Exceptional Women on Magic 106.7. We talk to all kinds of women, CEOs and authors and celebrities, but we also talk to teens and your next door neighbor and the person who is quietly making things happen. Being exceptional is about having a story or a mission or even a dream. So let us know if you know someone like that. Email us, go to magic1067.com and click on Exceptional Women and then join Tina Gao and me every Sunday morning at 7.30. Thanks for listening and enjoy your Sunday.